G'day ladies and gents, Cubic Meter here. In the previous video, we had a look at the defensive aspects of our strategy in Sipover's one block event. This led to the construction of Minecraft's ultimate PvP base, but we also had an offensive strategy. You may have noticed that we used the orbital strike cannon during the event, but unfortunately it wasn't much use during Doomsday. In fact, it appears to have survived almost completely intact throughout the entirety of Doomsday. We have two slime blocks missing from this flying machine, somehow a minecart missing from the safety system, and somehow this chunk loader remaining fully functional even after sustaining a direct hit from an explosion. You know what? Cast your bets now down in the comment section. Do you reckon this is going to work or is it going to fail catastrophically? If I go ahead and punching the fire the settings, then spectators generate chunks is set to false. There we go, chunk loading's off. But you look at that, it's actually prepping the payload. Alright, the payload is done, hasn't exploded yet. Now it's moving on to the acceleration stage. Surely it's going to explode here, right? No, seems like it's accelerating fine. Oh my god. Is this thing actually still working? That is insane. Alright, it's deposited the payload and once it reaches the bottom it's going to fire. Let's go to where the target is. I think it's targeting roughly the center here. Oh! Yep, there was definitely an explosion here. I think the cannon is still working, what? Wait a minute, so if we could have accessed this during the final fight, like if I set the world border to the center to 16 like that, see the world border's all the way over here, is the orbital strike cannon actually usable outside the world border? Hang on. Ah, uh, The player can't use things outside the world border. So even if we could access it, we couldn't even hit the button to turn it on. Yeah, I don't think there was any chance to use this during Doomsday. I mean, our plot is so small that, like, over in the corner over there, it is only barely outside the render distance of our playable area. Plus, on Doomsday, Sipover announced that the Nether would be disabled, meaning we wouldn't even be able to use the chunk loading system. So that was disappointing. We had a weapon of mass destruction, but didn't even get to use it. However, we did use it. During the event, we had this middle arena called No Man's Land, the center of which housed an important resource block, and the Orbital Strike Cannon served an important role to intimidate and zone players away from the middle zone. And one of the highlights of the event was when we lured Foray MC straight into the Orbital Strike Cannon. This is where we start to see a gap in the capabilities of the Orbital Strike Cannon. People will see its destructive capabilities and assume that it is an effective weapon for combat. However, this impressive damage to blocks does not exactly translate to such impressive damage to the player. In this clip from Foray's point of view, we have Pierce and Paradox drawing Foray to the exact location where a stab charge has been aimed. During this ordeal, I'm in the nether on the cannon's control platform, standing in front of a portal with a golden carrot in my hand, ready to load the payload and strike the position instantly. Foray's instincts as a skilled PvP are kick in. Suspicious of the ordeal, he approaches from below to scout out the area for potential traps, and builds an additional floor as a backup to avoid falling into the void. To our amazement, he tunnels through the floor in the exact position where the cannon is aimed. I pull the trigger and you can see the moment where the game freezes due to the cannon firing. We score a direct hit with a blast so powerful it accelerates Foray into the bedrock wall at supersonic speeds. The blast has deleted 19 out of 20 of his health points, and he manages to wall clutch at the perfect moment to avoid taking enough fall damage to kill him. The reason Frey survived is due to something known as damage frames. When a player or entity takes damage, they will perform the hurt animation, causing them to flash red for half a second. This red flashing is the damage frame, a moment of somewhat invulnerability after taking damage. Once the damage frame is initiated, the player or entity will only receive the largest amount of damage from a single source within that frame. Meaning if I try to punch this golem, you can see it ignores 
the damage from my punch. If I try to hit this golem with another TNT, like so, it will also ignore that damage. However, it should be noted that the damage frame is not a true invulnerability. If we go ahead and freeze again, and instead I start by punching the golem, you see my punch deals exactly one hit point of damage, but if we go ahead and add the TNT onto this, you'll see that the TNT completely overrided the damage I did with my fist because it was a larger damage source. For reference, if we add the damages together separately outside of the damage frame, you can see we get the expected 43 health remaining. It is this moment of somewhat invulnerability during the damage frame that causes a single TNT to be just as effective as a thousand TNT if all the explosions happen at the same time. This is also what limits the effectiveness of the orbital strike cannon. Another factor which impacts the lethality of the cannon is damage reduction due to armor and protection. Each set of armor has two base stats, the defense points and toughness. Defense points provide the damage reduction and toughness allows the armor to endure higher damage sources. This graph compares the damage of a source with the reduction in damage provided by each armor set. What we see is that armor becomes less effective with increased damage, however this trend caps off at some extreme value to provide a flat rate of protection. You'll notice our armor sets below diamond all have the same rate of decreasing effectiveness, but their differing defense point values provide differing levels of protection. Diamond and netherite have the same defense points, but different toughness values, so their endurance into high damage values differ at the extremes. Protection and Chance then provide a flat damage reduction to whatever damage penetrates the armor. Full Prop 4 gives a 64% reduction, however you can obtain up to 80% resistance to specific damage types such as projectiles, explosions or fire. Note that the damage reduction will always cap off at 80%. Finally we get to these graphs which show us the kinds of damage the player can survive with differing levels of protection, along with distance to a TNT explosion required to kill a fully geared player. We find that the maximum damage a fully geared player can survive is 72, which occurs at a range of less than a block from the explosion origin of a TNT. That is an incredibly close distance. In fact, you practically have to be inside of the TNT to even guarantee that you'll take enough damage to die instantly. Which means, to have hit Foray for 19 damage, the Orbital Strike Cannon must have hit him just barely less than a block away. That is incredibly accurate, especially given we could not possibly predict the exact position he would be standing when the orbital strike hit, and it still wasn't enough to kill him. So what would it take to guarantee a one shot on a fully geared player? Well, we can try hitting them with multiple TNT outside of the damage frame, however the problem with this is that the first blast will knock them back, and the second blast won't deal as much damage because they're further away. And this is especially a problem when you consider that there is a cooldown for the damage but no cooldown for the knockback. What we need is a single damage source that can instantly kill the player on the spot. And it turns out that we have a mechanism that can do exactly that. You see, the damage done by an arrow will scale with its velocity. So, give an arrow enough acceleration and it can one-shot anything. So let's get our engineering pants on and see if we can make the ultimate PvP weapon. To start with, we'll be following the tried and tested formula of the Orbital Strike Cannon. So be sure to watch my video about the science behind the Orbital Strike Cannon to get an understanding of what this formula entails. In summary, the Orbital Strike Cannon will deliver an explosive payload above the target in order to rain down destruction. However, what we want to do now is replace the explosive payload with a piercing one. Using our lazy acceleration method, we can dispense the arrows in lazy chunks with random offsets, then have them disperse over a large area. Here is a simple mock-up using command blocks of what this might look like. If I go ahead and dispense a whole bunch of arrows and teleport them into one spot, we can then down accelerate them into this massive shotgun blast. If we spawn a bunch of victims in the form of iron golems, we can then demonstrate that our scatter charge of arrows is highly effective at nullifying an entire area. And it turns out that with the right alignment, it can take as little as 40 TNT 
to one-shot a player with any arrow. However, if we add totems into the mix like so, no matter how much damage the player takes, they can always survive a hit. However, using our knowledge of damage frames, we can offset two separate payloads by exactly 10 ticks, and thus, even with totems, the player does not stand a chance. So that's all great, however, there is one gigantic problem looming over the horizon. The problem is that TNT and arrows are different entities with different hitboxes and eyeline positioning. Which means they respond differently to explosion knockback from a given position. So if you simply try to get a bunch of arrows and some TNT in the same position and try to accelerate them with more TNT, the arrows and the TNT won't end up in the same position. This is a huge problem for the orbital strike cannon which relies upon linear combinations of acceleration for propulsion. Because in order for our payload to work at the target, we need a very precise alignment between our arrows and the TNT even when traveling a great distance. So how can we make sure that our arrows and our TNT go to exactly the same target coordinates? What we need to do is separate the arrows from the TNT. Then we have separate acceleration chambers which will count the same linear combinations of TNT to accelerate our payloads. The trick could be to find a way that we can offset the propellant for each chamber such that the resulting velocity is equivalent for both the TNT and the arrows. In this graph I have fixed the Z offset and varied the X offset to obtain the resulting X and Z components of the velocity in both our arrow and TNT. Note how the motion of our arrow closely resembles the motion of our TNT despite them being different entities. However, this tiny difference can result in a huge discrepancy when accelerating to thousands of blocks per tick. If we take the difference between the motions for each axis, we obtain these surface plots. The red line represents the unity contour, a region of the surface which intersects the zero plane. Every point in these contours represents offsets which produce similar accelerations in each axis for our arrow and TNT. We are only interested in points along the unity contours that intersect between our axes. Finally, if we combine the unity contours into the same graph, we can locate a point at which they intersect. If we can get our propelling TNT to the positions defined by these offsets, we can ensure that the arrows and the TNT get the same acceleration in both the X and Z directions. The result is that we have these very specific alignments for the arrow and the TNT respectively. And if we go ahead and spawn TNT at these exact positions like so, would you look at that? The TNT got roughly 0.76 and the Z, arrow got 0.76 and the Z, and if we compare the decimal places, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 decimal places before the motions start to deviate. That means that with these offsets, we could accelerate our payloads out to a million blocks away and only lose about 10 microns of alignment. Let's just appreciate for a moment that we have measured something in Minecraft using microns. For reference, a block in Minecraft is a meter and textures on the block are 16 by 16, meaning each pixel is about 62.5 millimeters or 62,500 microns. So now we know the alignments needed for our propelling TNT, how do we actually get the TNT into these specific offsets? Well, the Z offsets are pretty straightforward because I had the intuition to use very commonly available alignments such as slamming the TNT into a block or slamming the TNT into a trapdoor. On the other hand, the X alignments are not so straightforward because these were just chosen arbitrarily to some decimal precision. For the more precise alignments, we'll need to use an entity with a solid hitbox such as a boat. Putting the boat in a minecart then enables us to employ a method shown by Tuno Tunin to dial in the decimal precision. And with that, we have perfectly aligned TNT to some arbitrary offset. Taking a look at the decimal places and our boat alignment has gotten as accurate to within 10 decimal places. With the acceleration stage figured out, we need to plan a strategy for assembling the payload. 
What we need to do is make sure that the arrows and the TNT are aligned upon launch in the powdered snow which will arrest their momentum at the target. A slab provides the perfect hitbox for aligning both our TNT and arrow entities, as when the piston moves an entity, it will move the entity by exactly 1.01 blocks over 2 ticks. This means that after the first tick, our entities are offset by exactly 0.01 in the vertical. The arrow's hitbox is exactly half a block tall, and so it is a fair distance away from touching our powder snow. Our TNT is exactly 0.98 blocks tall, so it is also just barely not touching the powdered snow. However, if we tick again, like so, our positions are offset by exactly 0.51. Our arrow has ended the motion with the very top of its hitbox just barely touching the powdered snow, and likewise for the TNT, it has finished the second tick of motion with about half of its hitbox inside of the powdered snow. Note how our entities still have their motion. And in fact, they will remain this way for as long as the entities remain frozen in stasis. However, the instant we go to move our entities, like so, would you look at that? The motion from the arrows and the TNT has been completely deleted. This is how we ensure that the payload stop dead above the target after traveling at hypersonic speeds. All we need to do is make use of our lazy chunks, accelerate our payload, align it inside of the powdered snow, and the instant we go to load the payload, it will snap to the target. Something doesn't seem right here. I've gone ahead and disabled gravity for both of these entities. If I start entity ticking... Where are you going, buddy? If I create our entities like so, and then if I push them with a piston, like that, start entity ticking, no motion. Motion is deleted, right? That's the way that it's supposed to work. Create the entities. And then if we start entity processing, the TNT stops, but the arrow just keeps going. Where, wh what are you doing, buddy? Get back over there. Nothing's not right here. Okay, we appear to have stumbled into a massive blunder. I've gone ahead and spoken to some people in the TNT archives, and according to them, arrows apparently don't move. And I think what they actually mean is that arrows don't use the movement method. In general, the movement method is what allows entities, well, to move. At least normally. When you push an entity with a piston, the move method is called, which changes the position of the entity. However, arrows, and in fact any projectile such as eggs, snowballs, or enderpearls, apparently don't use the movement method when moving under their own motion. They use their own method, and this method omits the powdered snow momentum cancelling effect. But let me show you something that's really funny. If you go ahead and create your arrow with momentum, because it's been pushed into the powdered snow using the move method, it's now flagged itself for motion removal by the movement method. However, because the arrow flying doesn't use the movement method, it will retain that flagging by the powdered snow until the movement method is called again. So if I go ahead and place down a piston like so, and then we use the piston to push the arrow, which calls the movement method. And then, start the arrow ticking again. It's removed the motion of the arrow even after it's moved away from the powdered snow. This is extremely hilarious, but also extremely frustrating. So what this means is that while we can get the TNT to stop dead over the target, it's not going to be possible to get the arrows to stop over the target. Unfortunately, this means that the entire principle of this cannon is just a non-starter. If there's no way to get the arrows to stop over the target, then there's simply no way to make the orbital piercer.
This was not a complete failure. We still learned a lot of cool things and did some cool maths. But unfortunately, the concept of the piercer, a one-shot solution to the orbital strike's capability gap, has eluded us. I'm not going to give up that easily though, we will find a way to make the ultimate death ray, but that will have to wait for a future video.